looks like we're ready. Grace, peace, and welcome to Podcast of the Wills. My name is Nick Milkey, and I am not joined today by my co-host, Steve Renault. Steve is not able to join us. He is busy, as we have mentioned on some of our previous episodes. He is working on a doctoral program right now. He is also a full-time pastor, and so Steve is very busy, and they are not. Um, he had one of those weeks where he was going to try and get here, but he said he couldn't swing it, but that's okay because I'm here. Actually, I don't know if me being here makes it okay or not, but we have an awesome guest and we're going to talk to him in just a minute. Usually we do news in this part of the podcast to start. Um, there's not a ton that I think I have seen over the last week or so. The biggest excitement is that we're about 11 days away from season two of The Mandalorian dropping on Disney+. Plus. And I think the biggest news coming out of that is that supposedly tonight during Monday Night Football, there's going to be some sort of behind the scenes or other small trailer drop, something just to keep everybody excited over the next 10 or 11 days. So by the time you hear this, that will hopefully have already happened and maybe we'll see something neat. We don't know what it's going to be yet, but we are going to jump right in. Um, I'm excited to introduce my guest. This is actually the first time I've got to quote unquote meet him in person, but we have interacted on social media thanks to his lovely wife, Alexis, who my wife knows. Um, but we are joined today by Mari Sterling and Mari is an actor, a long working actor in Los Angeles. He has done stage. He has done TVs. He has done movie voiceover, which we're going to get to. And I don't want to give a detailed reading of Mari's credits list, but there are some things on here um that i think are just fantastic and so mari was in the movie outbreak behind enemy lines smoke and aces beverly hills chihuahua the a-team movie um as far as tv shows go he's probably been in every tv show you've maybe ever watched at some point in your life um picket fences boy meets world columbia e colombo er star trek enterprise six feet under nip tuck Deadwood, which is a long personal favorite of mine and might be on my Mount Rushmore of TV shows. Um, we were watching TV maybe a year and a half ago and we're watching an episode of Longmire and who came walking into the scene but Mari Sterling in an episode of Longmire. Um, Always Sunny in Philadelphia. But what I think most of our listeners will hopefully know Mari from, and it's hard because your name is Mari and this character's name is Max. And so I may call you Max at some point during this interview. All right. But you played Max in Homeland, and that's certainly a big deal and was such a great role. Um, I know that you did a lot of really, really great work, especially in that. So welcome to Podcast of the Wills. Thank you so much for joining us on a Monday morning to talk Star Wars. It is my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, thrilled to meet you virtually the best we can do <laughs> for now. But yeah. A absolutely. Well, we are honored that you are here. And what we are looking forward to doing today is, you know, I want you to start out by just telling us about yourself, telling us about how you got into acting, you know, give give us the the 411 on Maury. It's actor's, actor's favorite question. Let me talk about myself. Um, <laughs> Please do. That's why we're here. <laughs> I was born in uh, the Bay Area. I grew up in the Valley, which is just north of San Francisco, uh, by about half hour, 45 minutes. Um, yeah, it was fun, fun place to grow up. Uh, story short, got into acting uh, when I was about seven. Um, the story I used to tell was I didn't like baseball. And what was the story? I think I made up some story of, yeah, I didn't like baseball and I was getting into too much trouble and I saw a theater and I wanted to do that. I think the truth is I just walked by the theater one day and I saw this thing happening and I immediately felt this pull of, I want to do that. Um, so I started doing theater as a kid and um, did it all, all through up to high school, did local theater in various capacities, um, did some musical theater um, and then went to high school in San Francisco and I was pretty well-rounded there. I played lacrosse and soccer and then I do the spring. Um, uh, kids knew me as the actor. I mean, I think I always knew that that was something I wanted to do and loved to do. Um, um, and then the big decision was to sort of when I got to college of where I was going to go and I chose to go to UCLA and to do the theater program there. So that was when I really decided like, all right, mom, dad, I'm going for it. Um, and uh, did the uh, did the theater program at UCLA, which was great and just got to do play after play after play after play. Um, which for me has always been the best way to, for me, theater has really been the best way to learn because you kind of, you, you get to dive into something and stick with it and keep coming at it for, you know, weeks to months at a time and, and learn how to refine things and be with something. 
um, kind of distill the character. And, and you, you also, you know, you get to do a broader, you get to play more characters too. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then graduated from UCLA with, pretty green in terms of Hollywood in the business, had no idea what I was doing, tripping over myself left and right. I was just an idiot. Um, luckily, I had a few people who saw through my nonsense and, and gave me a break uh, that started getting me some agents and got some help. Um, Outbreak was my first, uh, I'd done some commercial work, but I went to a, a, a gal I'd gone to college with who was in casting and I went to her and said, please, 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 can you help me? I'm a guy with absolutely no Do you know anybody who wants a guy with nothing? <laughs> uh, which is always a great, you know, intro, um, namely looking for a, well, no, I don't on that, but why don't you come read for this part, read for this movie. And it was one of those roles where everybody reads the same scene and then they just throw you in a bunch of different point of doors opening up and people going, you know, it's just one of those, it was just luck in that sense of who's this guy, who's this, who's this face. Um, and that kind of started the ball rolling. And, um, you know, it's been a long, cool, uh, thing, wild, frustrating uh, life. Um, I feel fortunate and very grateful that I've been able to uh, career as an actor. Uh, it's taken me all over the world. I've unbelievable people. I've wanted to quit. I don't know how many times. I'm just stubborn and I just, um, and all the cliches. Um, and yeah, and it's, it's just been, a, it's been an amazing ride. Uh, Homeland really, yeah, that's, that's, that we just wrapped that up and that, that has been sort of the most notable, of us. um, but, uh, yeah, that's kind of the, 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 the big, the broad stroke. And that's, I, I think that's amazing. And I like hearing you say, you know, what those of us who do not work in the entertainment business, but, you know, have read and paid attention over the years and you hear exactly what you're saying, how much it's a journey and how, you know, you do have to go through the ups and the downs and the hating it and, you know, being ready to quit. And I think one of the things that's so impressive, and I wonder if this leads, maybe this is my question, does it help lead to the longevity you've had is the diversity in, I mean, just what I used was your IMDb page and the, why, I mean, you've got TV, you've got movies, you've got voice work. I know you do stage stuff. You've done independent stuff. Like there, I, surely that has to help in being uh, able to make a career out of it. Yeah, I do. I mean, I think it's good. I'm mean, like anything. You, you practice, practice. I've been thinking a lot lately. Like, sort of, what what, what are the ten? What are the things? In, uh, you know, emotionally, spiritually, just everything, and and a lot of what it comes mm -hmm. back practice and discipline and not giving up. And, and um, theater has always kept me, I mean, luckily when I graduated from college, what, what I really left with from UCLA was a really close group of friends who we started a theater company. That for at least the first people started having family and doing theater for three months at a time that you could get paid nothing for was kind of becoming untenable. Uh, you know, that kept us buoyant. It kept us alive. It kept sure. us in the work. It kept us Keeps your mind on track. Um, or oh, some of the, the best advice. I remember reading a book by Carl, a school actor, saying, "You know, his mm -hmm. advice to actors is get a hobby, find something else in life that you love, find something else that's going to keep you um, not so. You'll just go trying to base your sanity on the highs and lows of the business. You know, sure, something something that can ground you, something that grounds you, something keeps you steady, and you know. And he's like, I don't care, gardening, whatever. For me, it was martial arts, and then I fell in love with horses and I and I, that kept me out a lot you know I'd work here and go to the ranch and work there and, sure. and that kept me, that kept me grounded and it's also good because it gives you stories it gives you things to talk about mm -hmm. it continue to after you're always watching what is that person like and you know I don't know this I was raised this way with this mindset these beliefs these attitudes why don't I go somewhere else and and really embrace like well, what about you know it's, 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 side note is that sorry about a plane going over but side note is that's, <laughs> kind of, that's what i love about art is it's to really play a character you got to get through your own nonsense so you can't be in a character you gotta you gotta get what are those characters judgments what are their thoughts what are their feeling so um 
yeah, got off track there, but I think, but no, long that's awesome. way of saying how, how, how to stay alive. And I think practice, practice, discipline, mm -hmm. practice will keep you, keep you in it and, and tune. Absolutely. And I, and I think like you said, with what Carl Malton said about a hobby, something that can ground yeah. you outside of it. Some of the things that you mentioned, and you said this a little bit already, as far as getting stories, but like something like martial arts, like that brings discipline. That's a part of doing that. So not only does it help you have a physical release, but you're learning those other skills and whether it's, you know, doing an intent shoot where you have to be, you know, in a war zone type situation like Homeland or, sure. you know, that could be isolating. You know, the stories we've read, I think one of the big marquee ones was Jim Carrey doing the live action Grinch movie and being in that suit and the things that he tried to do to keep from going nuts because he was isolated or, you know, th those disciplines and those things, whether it's gardening, whether it's something else, there's going to be other takeaways that hopefully you're able to apply to your career. Exactly. No, absolutely. And, and, and I think that's probably for all of us, you know, whatever exactly. career you're in, those hobbies are going to inform either hopefully being better at your job, being a better family person, whatever it is that release, uh, talk a little bit of, if you would, like I said, you've got such a varied catalog. Um, what have been some of the highlights? Like obviously Homeland was such a big, like you said, it was a marquee oh, thing for your career. But like, you know, I think about Deadwood and I go, holy crap, to be on the Deadwood set for a couple of days, that would be so fun. Uh, it may not have been. It may have been really miserable. But looking at your looking at your list of stuff you've done, I'm sure there's a million fun stories of people you met, yeah. experiences. Give us a couple of highlights. Um, just in general, because it took us all over the world and it was, you know, South Africa, uh, New York, Virginia, uh, Morocco, you know, even it's in it. That's just one of the general perks of the job be in new places. Um, mm -hmm. And the level of uh, talent, you know, it was really, you really had to be a, on your team, you know, because uh, everyone was bringing it. Um, mostly that's been my experience. I didn't work with Kiefer Sutherland on 24. Um, mm -hmm. uh, doing Hearts War and hanging out with Bruce Willis and all those characters. We're running around in the Czech Republic. Um, uh, De Deadwood was amazing because because you go to work and watch. I was really a fly on the wall, on a bit bit part, sure. but I had two days of work. Um, and some of, some of my greatest experiences are where I acted like a complete idiot. I had a scene where I was basically a glorified extra behind Tim Oliphant and um, mm -hmm. scene, and I. Was, oh my gosh, that's amazing! I was sitting. I was a bar patron, and I was in the back just it up. And, you know, they came up and basically said, this is not about you, right? Um, <laughs> You're pulling focus away from the leads here. Dude, probably the worst kind of acting. And, uh, but at the same time, I'm, once I got schooled and humbled, I, you know, I watched Ian McShane apply methodology to a scene. And it was one of the most amazing things oh I've God. ever seen. Watch, watch. Speaking of speaking of people, we need in a Star Wars. Mm -hmm. We need Ian McShane in a I'll Star watch, Wars. I watch him doing it. No, he would. Yeah, yeah. He's right. We can put him in so many places in Star Wars. Um, that was great. Uh, I mean, the behind enemy lines I did was was the knockoff version, and uh, we did in the you know things for six weeks, and and not. And there's always a person or an event or something you walk away from. Uh, I remember doing the A team. And uh, Rampage, we were a bunch of fancy people. There was Brad, Liam Neeson, with Jessica, people who are very fancy. Rampage Jack, sure. clearly. And there was a kid who came, if he could take Rampage. And finally, the kid, I guess he wanted to leave, just decided to take his picture. Rampage is a very nice person in my he just whipped out and grabbed that oh, a picture. And I was watching this whole thing going, oh, dude, you just took Rampage's <laughs> phone. Or he just took your phone. Like, what are what, you, you are so screwed. <laughs> a a, a few hilarious. moments. That's right. Yeah. Just a few moments. Well, um, well, we are obviously a Star Wars podcast, and that's a lot of what I would, you know, love to hear about. Um, tell us about your Star Wars journey. Did you grow up a Star Wars fan? Is it something I know it's work and we're going to talk about yeah. that part of it in a few I, minutes. Uh, um, 
but I would love to hear if you have an origin story, if it was something, or if like baseball, you kind of went, mm, that's fine. And you moved on. I was laughing today, Nick, because you know, you, you're going to do things like this. He goes, all right, you want to sound good, say the right thing. Don't feel like a total moron. Um, you know, my Star Wars enough and completely geeked out. So I have my, you know. Oh, look uh, at that. Um, I don't know if you can see up there, but during pandemic i uh started collecting the bondi series of samurai star wars mash oh wow pictures. so I, I started giggling of uh we have star <laughs> uh pictures in our bathroom um it was fun to go back and start thinking six when the 1977 the first movie came out mm -hmm. and i remember so thank you because it brought sort of this nostalgic like it i remember oh, absolutely waiting in line i think it was on geary avenue in san francisco i was there with my mom and, sister, and there was this line and there was this feeling i don't know there was this and in the line nobody knew what we were going to see mm -hmm. And that's exactly then what did happen. Because we walked into that theater. Now so much of the Star Wars dialogue, right, is like, well, what do you think about this versus that? And how do you feel about the right should have done? And they and everybody's got their kind of tribal camp on the mistake and the, the deal. <laughs> Correct. Right? This, this, was, that didn't exist. This, this was, there was, so, and I'll never forget seeing that movie for we this nothing like it existed had ever existed that's exactly right you know then it started with the follow-ups um my stepbrother chris worked at i my favorite we got to go in and see uh the models and and the designs and the whole thing and that was one of the most amazing things i'd ever seen so we saw the hoth landscape of the of using different size models for perspective uh -huh. of ad ats being in the background or small in the background and then getting bigger. Um, it was a room that was probably, I don't know, 15 by 20, 12 foot high ceilings, and the walls were just models, all different kinds, tanks, planes, boats. And these artists would reach on the shelf and pull off a model and open it up and take out a wing. And then that's how they the TIE fighter or the X Wing. They, 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 Assembling all these pieces. I mean, it was, it was, it was, you know, um, I'm so ashamed to say that I used to have a, uh, uh, um, a set of Return of the Revenge of the Jedi sweatshirt, which I think I lost mm -hmm. or gave away. Um, and I figures, uh, that's why I'm recollecting. Um, <laughs> that's right. No, always time to start over. You start over. And this, this mashup of Samurai right. Star Wars is, is like my geek out heaven. Um, that's so cool. So those are the early, but it, yeah, it's like I grew up with it, mm -hmm. you know, and, mm -hmm. and it, it's amazing. Yeah, that's something that, yeah, and that's something that we talk a lot about. We've done, you know, episodes of our show. We did a 40th Empire Strikes Back anniversary episode a while back awesome. and had a couple of friends on. And I'm, you know, I am was born in 78, so I was not there for star wars but by the time empire was coming out i was younger my dad was already watching it and then return of the jedi i definitely saw in fact i remember seeing that at a drive-in theater oh. in the oh. 80s and 83 you know with my parents in the back of a station wagon but it's the same thing yeah. like star wars has always been here and it's funny because laura my wife gives me a hard time sometimes she's like how are you so into this thing and i'm like it's never not been around like it's always been present and, you know, it's gone through its ebbs and flows, as we've talked about. And so you got those first three movies. And th and that's and I've listened to several things recently where they said exactly what you said about the excitement of being in line. And nobody had any idea what was coming. There had been nothing remotely like this before. The groundbreaking nature of what George Lucas did, but the story. And I always go back to, in anything, story is the driver. And the story was there. And the things that he pulled from to tell those stories, those spaghetti Westerns, the Kurosawa films, like all these things that informed what he made, you look at it and you go, well, of course that's likable. And I think that there's so many elements in that. We're seeing more of that now with some of this newer stuff, especially in the Mandalorian. I think there's so many connecting points back to that original spirit of what George Lucas did. 
but like you said, there also wasn't competition and there wasn't a bunch of people on social media picking apart the reveal and empire strikes back because it was just, Holy cow, this amazing thing happened. I hope we get another one. Um, but like, I love that point. It's always been present for me as, as a, you know, a person who's 42 years old, it's always been around. It's always been a part of what I've loved and been into. Um, and then we move into the newer eras. Yeah. No, the fact that it's crossed so many generations too is amazing. Without a doubt. And even now, you know, I watched it with my dad growing up and I remember the other part of watching those early movies was somehow he had them recorded on beta tapes, not even VHS tapes. He had them on beta tapes recorded off HBO and we wore those tapes out. We just, you know, they got to the point where they didn't work anymore, but that was something that I shared with him. And, but now my girls, like I, one of my twins is 12 years old and she loves star Wars and she's constantly like, Hey, can we watch star Wars? Hey, can we do this? And so for me, you know, there, there is that crossover generationally that is something that I'm just like, and I have all girls, so I wasn't sure I'd get to do that, but I've, you know, my girls in varying degrees are into right. it. Um, because it doesn't have to be for boys or girls either, obviously. But, um, but yeah, the generational crossover, and and like you said, especially for you to get to have seen that original first movie, I just can't imagine how amazing that was to walk and that blend. Yeah, yeah. No, I remember when um, New Hope came out again. Oh, sorry, for a second. That's right. When New Hope came out again uh, with the re-release with the added scenes. I mean, what I'll also never forget there is guys my age like pushing their kids. <laughs> yeah. It was great. Mm -hmm. great. No doubt. Well, and you made another point talking about collecting and it's never too late to collect stuff again. The shift from the toys that you and I had as a kid and a lot of us, you know, most of us lost them or they disappeared in yard sales Mm -hmm. over the years or just didn't survive. Mm -hmm. And now you have this new weird version of collecting where like a lot of the Star Wars toys that are being produced or being produced for people our age these black series six inch figures that are $20. My parents would have laughed in my face to buy me a $20 action figure as a kid, but that's not who they're making them for. And it creates that kind of juxtaposition of like the collectors that are going to go buy them all up and try and scalp them on eBay, things that we didn't have either as a kid, but it also opens up. And of course we have things like eBay, so you can go get, you know, I collect a decent amount and most of mine is focused on like vintage stuff. Like I want to go get, you know, the figures I had as a kid, I want to get, you know, these other things. But then I also like the more specific, like just collectibles that aren't necessarily toys. Um, I have, there's the old deleted scene when they were shooting Star Wars after they blow up the Death Star and Mark Hamill's getting out of the X-Wing and Carrie Fisher hands him up the beer can and it's the little celebration. And I went and found what kind of beer it was and ordered a can. It's a British beer of some kind because they were in London. Oh, yeah. um, and I'm like, to me, those kind of little yeah. things are like, that's a fun Star yeah, Wars sure. collectible. Um, but it, le- you know, there leaves so much out there that you can find. And of course, it's, you know, it's a spender's market. If you've got the money and want to go for it, you can go crazy. Um But yeah, but so for you to have grown up with it, that's amazing. And then, you know, for me in the 90s, the expanded universe books, like I read, you know, a good number of those before they kind of changed the canon to what after Disney bought it and kind of threw some of that out. Right. And that was our lifeline because the prequels weren't announced and those movies weren't coming along. Did you have an experience similar to mine when the prequels came out, was that a letdown? Was it just exciting that there was more star Wars? Did it register at that point? The, pre- uh, the, the first, the second three, the first, yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, let down, yeah. let down that, that I think we all shared of what the heck, sure. ju- what <laughs> is going on of, uh, so, and, and, and that led then to, again, the excitement of then the last round of, of, and where we are now of getting to realize like, oh, wait a minute, all these other stories. Oh, this is really cool now. Like we can keep living. Yeah, the, the second three, one, two, and three felt like a, not a, I would think a mistake, but, um, I was still excited. I was still going to see because curiosity and wanting to 
be no in doubt. the world was stronger than, you know, not, but yeah, it felt like a, a what the heck yeah. happened. No doubt. No doubt. And I, and I agree with you completely. And I think it's one of those, you know, we had gone so long and the fact that we were getting anything made a lot of things forgivable, yeah. but then we reached a point when then the second new one came, you're like, really, we're still doing yeah. this. Like yeah. what happened? And yeah. And George had a chance to come back and try and do things he couldn't do before. And I think there's, you know, some short shrift sometimes it's given to the fact that in the first three, he did amazing things, invented new technology, did all this other stuff. And even for those second round, he was still inventing things and he was still doing motion capture more than other people had been doing and breaking ground. That's always kind of been his deal. But it almost at one point reached a, we don't have to go quite that far, George. <laughs> Maybe we can put a couple more practical things in, build a couple more sets. Yeah. And it was, it, they felt, um, they lost a little bit of, there was a darkness in the first three that I thought got locked in the, in the, in, in, in new hope on one, two, and three, they, there, there was, they lost that, it, which I feel like we've also gotten back to right. one, like, mm -hmm. so, that there is, it's a dangerous world. This is a world of ragamuffins and rapscallions and, and, it, you know, that, that's the piece I've always liked about, it, it, you know, it's always on that line, but those, the, Mm -hmm. three felt like they lost that to me in a way for sure and it, it's i've thought i've noticed this over the years and as i'm seeing you know generally generationally as we mentioned before you have a generation of people who were eight and nine and ten years old when that second round of movies came out and that's their entry into star wars like that's their star wars and it appealed to them and there was probably some thought behind that marketing much bigger in the 90s and 2000s than it would have been in the seventies and the, and so there was a lot more, you know, you're going to get a figure for every weird character, even if they don't have a line or if they don't, mm -hmm. but kids grab like my girls when they were younger and they were watching various star Wars, the ones they loved the most was that middle three because they were more colorful and brighter and almost a little cartoony sure. compared to like you're saying the grittiness of the original three, um, and so, you know, it's all by design and it's all, you know, going to fit, hit certain people. And um, a, a podcaster that I listen to, Pete on Around the Galaxy, he always talks about everybody's doorway into the Star Wars universe, mm -hmm. you know, for his son, the Clone Wars cartoons. Right. For, you know, my girls, it was really more of the original trilogy, but that was because of me. And everybody, everybody finds a different way in. And that's what's yeah. also beautiful about the Star Wars universe is that there is a lot of different avenues that, you can come into it all. I think there's a, I know Brad Bird, the director, uh, when he, when he lives in a world, even though it's still it applies, but it sort of makes me think of it like in terms of storytelling and you saying, going back to story, mm -hmm. like that when he, even though he's working in an animated world where you could do it, still works within physical laws of gravity and limitation. And I think those laws create Absolutely. tension and tension is, creates drama so i think there can be a all especially with all this stuff, as a if you're all of a sudden you've got all these tools at your disposal of doing scenes and scene work you've never been able or you can lose those kind of boundaries as well and i the first you know new, it was even even in return of the jedi we started to it's he started to loosen up i think in terms of tone that's you right. know, it, we could kind of see from that where he might have been hit. Mm -hmm. For sure. Well, um, I want to transition a little bit because we've talked about your career. We've talked about Star Wars, but you have one of the, you know, one of the dream situations for somebody like me. Those two things converged. And I do want to talk about you've done a bunch of voiceover work. You've done a bunch of video games. Um, I know you did. Hush, you were also Paris in The Killing Joke, which was fantastic. Um, but you've done, and it was Star Wars, The Old Republic. And is that, I don't, I never played that one, but is that the online? That's the online big, one. Kind of immersive. I've never played it either. Um, <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. I, I don't think I've actually told my bosses that. Yeah, that's the master. <laughs> but talk about your talk about your Star Wars work and talk about what you've been able so, to do, uh, you know, through that. How that went was actually kind of great. I met these guys. I mean, I, I looked, I was, you know, I, was, I, was, I looked back and said, 
think my first credit is 2011. So it's been nine, it's probably been 10 years that I've been getting to do that. And, and that's just, um, but the fun story behind that where it started was I, I met these guys on a battlefront game that never came out. Um, it got caught up uh, yeah. bad financial companies. And so it got shelled and apparently the game is in a vault in France somewhere. Um, but the storyline was I was playing that the role I got to play were, were Jedi twins uh, okay. who one becomes a Sith, one becomes powerful Jedi. So the game itself was I got myself um, and I had scenes with Vader and like, just I, I, I was going to work not be. And then the best part about it was they did facial capture of my body was a, mm -hmm. a, a f so I had this really cool like walk. I looked really, really bad at <laughs> But anyhow, that, that's how it all started, which was which was uh, a, a really fun way in. And from that, that led to going and getting which is sort of Han Solo derivative uh, on, mm -hmm. on, mm -hmm. on my um, and it's just it's it's so much fun to do. That's amazing. I think to, that I think voiceover work to me is very fascinating overall. And, you know, as somebody who's watched, you know, Mark Hamill has had such a huge part of his career in voiceover. Um, you know, you, you see so many actors that do that. And I love that there's that crossover ability. And I would imagine even over the course of what we've dealt with since March, voiceover work hasn't suffered mm -hmm. the way a lot of your other work has suffered, I would guess. Yep. No, it's still going strong. It was considered, you know, an essential business sort of from the get go. So. Yeah. And you, you've even seen, I've seen on Twitter, some of the folks that are, you know, building impromptu voice studios in a closet and throwing right. up some towels on a bar and then you send it to somebody and they can edit it. And that's fascinating too. But I love watching, you know, I watch videos on YouTube. You'll see of, you know, folks in the studio or even, even doing VO for movies or drop-ins and that kind of stuff to watch the behind the scenes episodes of the Mandalorian where they show, you know, Pedro Pascal in front of a microphone watching it on a screen and like Favreau comes up and gives him a pillow to hold because he wants his body to be like, he's carrying baby Yoda. And it's to me, that is just, there's more in the process. It's more than just going in a booth and saying some things like you talked about earlier. It's a mindset and getting past your limitations or your, who you are to then be male smuggler or captain, whoever. It, it's a uh, um, voiceover is it's a real tightrope, and I, you actually just describe it very well in the sense of the way because there's nothing else. The way the tiniest position I remember a guy named Bob Bergen watching he was a guy doing a seminar with him, and he always says, it, "You know, I hope you have a picture because if you can phys slight physicalization changes the voice." holding that pillow mm -hmm. because of the direction of your head, what you, you just, it, who are you talking to? I mean, a lot of it's acting one-on-one, but I think there's something about the voiceover because it's such a tightrope. You know, if you just add now, like it, mm -hmm. things is fun, you know, be really good at it. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty good at it. It's, it's, it's amazing. The distinction that can come through. You also play and, things you would just wouldn't get to do, you know. Absolutely. And it, it's, you know, it's never not fascinating. Do you do impressions? I'm always, I'm amused by impressionists too, but that's another aspect that you see, you know, the examples I think of maybe more specifically are, you know, you've got Star Wars Rebels, you've got the Clone Wars, you've got these newer Star Wars animated shows, but then you've got, you know, the audio books. And so you're using you know, you're not going to get James Earl Jones to come in and do the audio book or reprise, you know, Vader for Clone Wars or Rebels or whatever. But you have Stephen Stanton and you have, um, you know, these other actors that come in and they can do a Tarkin or they can do, and you're sitting there going, no, that's really good. And, but it's not just a straight up copycat either. And so that's another element to me that I think is just fascinating. That's not a skill I would claim other than embarrassing. <laughs> Uh, but it's it's impressive the guys who can really do that. It, yeah. mm, absolutely, and you and again such an example to me 
or just a fun example is Mark Hamill's Joker. He, he's so I just uh, it's wild. It's wild. I love who he's become. <laughs> I, lo I love he's such a great example. I remember William Shat a long time ago. I think it was Terry Gross, NPR or something, and she was saying, well, "What do you think about your career?" Mm -hmm. And he said, "Career." I like, hear I am not. Um, uh, and he, you know, looking back, he's like, sure. I've had a career. Hamill feels like that too. Like who, who knew he was going to be Luke and now who he is, who he is now. I just I right. love it. Yeah. And it's so neat because it seemed like in a hot minute, he did get kind of typecast as Luke and cornered into that thing early on early because on. that was early on for him. Early he on. had, um, whatever uh endless summer whatever the movie mm -hmm. was before star wars like he had those one or two things but then star wars of course blew up and he couldn't have predicted how it would have blown up and then he did some things here and there but really his second i don't even know if it's his second wave of his career but so much of it has been animation and voiceover and then he's had you know and those are the things have crossed over to you know characters on some of the cw comic book shows yeah. and some of those other things that but but also, like you said, who he has become as a person, he recognizes it for what it is. He mm -hmm. has fun with it. He doesn't mm -hmm. take himself too seriously. Mm -hmm. You know, he's he's kind of he falls to me sometimes in that like Bill Murray category. Like if he passed you at a restaurant and you were having a party, he'd stick his head and be like, hey, guys, what's going yeah, on? Yeah. How you doing? And he what wouldn't, you, you know, he wouldn't big time. Uh -huh. He'd sit down and say, no. hey, what's going on yeah. here? Yeah. Or. Um, which is fun. And that's what you want in, certainly that's what you want in your heroes. You hear the thing about don't meet your heroes, you know, they'll let you down, but I feel like we'd be okay if we got to meet Mark Hamill. He wouldn't, he wouldn't let us down. No, no. Totally. Um, well, I want to transition again one more time and then we're going to get close to wrapping up because I'm thankful for what you've given me today. Um, we've talked about old star Wars. We talked about the middle star Wars. We're in a new, era of star Wars with Disney buying star Wars and Lucasfilm and all that a few years back. Um, you hit it before I ever got to it. You know, it has become very tribal. It has become very, you know, it can be a turnoff to be honest. There's a lot of, and at one point we have to stop and go, it's a movie about space wizards intended for kids. And yes, those kids grew up to be 40 and 50 year old adults. So we should calm down a little bit, but the new era of star Wars has brought three new movies. We've had animation shows. We've got the Mandalorian now, which is just kind of lighting everything on fire in a really fun way. Um, do you have any initial kind of thoughts about the new era of star Wars? Anything oh, that you know stands out? Um, well, I was thinking about uh, there's one. And, and also any potential future involvement you might have. I wish I had, I wish I had a surprise in that regard, um, but we'll see. I'll keep you posted. Um, nothing definite. Uh, I, 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 one of my window for me is valuable because of in particular, which is the scene between the two biker scouts in, I think it's the last episode directed by Taika Waititi. Like, uh -huh. That is one of the best scenes I have ever seen in Star Wars. Uh, <laughs> it's it, so it great. Was, like it just, because it was somebody together, which is what I love about JJ Abrams doing it. I, I mean, I'm I I like where we are now because there was kind of the middle wreckage of what the heck are the middle three? Now we get to be in this world pros cons however you feel. Sure. I mean, I just love it, and I don't have many. There have been moments where I was like, but over the latest run, I don't know the animation stuff as much, but um, I mean, I'm, I I think short answer. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, that, and that's awesome. And I'm not fishing for you to hammer on anybody. Cause I feel the way you do. I really feel like we're getting new star Wars. We should totally be happy. And sure. I wish, you know, some things in rise of Skywalker had been different, Yeah, but it was still fun. Still fun. It was still good. Still and me being mad about it changes nothing. changes nothing. Well, you made me think. Star Wars is so, you know, Star Wars is to me has always been about it light and dark. And where are you? You know, and, and actual re yang struggles, a very mythological, you know, I was raised with Joseph Campbell and all that kind of stuff. This was drawn mm -hmm. from the hero's quest. So where are you That's on right. your hero's quest? And if you're in that negative attack mind, 
careful empire, you know, like, like, where are you with the force? And, and I, I think that actually the why it's so powerful is that very simple struggle and so much the tribalism we're in now, sorry, like if you call yourself out on, on, you That's know, right. Well, and we've given so many people easy ways to just scream into the void and voice whatever opinion because of social media. And as you were saying that, and as we've been talking, I literally just kind of made some connecting points in my head. So this is going to be a very ill-informed theory, <laughs> my favorite. but I look at th th this. I mean, this is what I do, but looking at the original three and the time period with which we got the original three were in, they're made in the 76, 77, mm -hmm. come out late 77, early eighties. And you're coming out of Vietnam. You're coming out of the cold war. Things are kind of on the upswing for us as a country. And so there's mm -hmm. an overall excitement. You know, life is changing. You know, America's kind of getting its footing under Reagan, you know, all these other things that are going on. And so you kind of feel that echoed in not only the tone of the Star Wars movies themselves, but the people that are seeing it and it's happy and it's unifying and it's all this stuff. And so now over the course of the last four, five years, and not to get overtly political, but you look at the world that we've had over the last four or five years, and we've had these three new movies come out, and whether it's reflected in the movies themselves or not, it's reflected in the fan base of the toxicity in the world and the competition and tribalism in the world that you see on a political front, on a social front, and those same people end up, unfortunately, sometimes being Star Wars fans, and so they as ascribe those views to how they approach star Wars and well, it shouldn't have been about this person or why did they get all the time? Where did all the dudes go? Like, you know, but I, there's a parallel there that I'm sure somebody much smarter than me has explored already, but you see it kind of in the tone of the time mm -hmm. you're in and you know, the way the fandom interacts. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a, I don't have a concluding thesis to that, but it hit me while you were talking. Yep. That it's just, you know, it's a reflection of our times and I'm sure all, I mean, all art is a reflection of our times, no doubt. You know, you have other things that come out at different times. And you go, wow, life was nuts in the 80s when they were making Wall Street and when they were making, you know, whatever else that it was that reflected those same crazy times. But I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about it from a Star Wars standpoint, and especially from a fan culture standpoint. Um, so I think that's interesting um, just to see the difference. But it, I love, too, and like you said, talking about Mandalorian, you know, it brings something really fun to this Star Wars universe. And I think it comes back to not only story, because it is a fun story and the reports are they're going to expand that story more in this new season and kind of branch it out so that it's not solely focused on him and the baby. Yet. And part of that's going to be marketing, setting up other spinoffs sure. and some other things that they're going to try and do, which is normal. But the thing I love, and I think it was on... um they did that gallery series on Disney plus. That's the eight episode behind the scenes stuff about the making of Mandalorian. It was as many episodes as the show itself. And if you haven't watched it, I recommend it. It's fantastic. Um, but one of the episodes where John Favreau and Dave Filoni are talking and you kind of have this fun dynamic to me, Favreau has a lot of Lucas qualities to him and wanting it to be about the story, but also looking at like, the technology, the volume that they've created, this big using game footage and game engine technology and all these other things. But then you've got Dave Filoni and he's the Star Wars nerd at the table. Like he's the guy going, mm, you can do that. But this other thing, and he learned it directly from George Lucas and worked under him. But you see the things that they put in that show. And it's like if we had gotten together with our toys as kids and went, we want to make a movie and we want this guy to do this and this ship to come in. And they took all that stuff and wait, we get to do that. And so there's, to me, there's a very genuine Star Wars love in that and the way that they're doing it. It's not strictly, you know, and the different voices. I love the different director, Taika Waititi. I mean, I want him to do everything, but Bryce Dallas Howard and um, Fukuya, Rick mm -hmm. Fumiyama, F Fumiyawa, yep. you know, all those people bring such, again, different voices, different perspectives which is so fun. And I, I think it makes it a better, th a better product when it's made that yeah, way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so it just, it's fun. Well, I hope that sometime in the future, 
we're going to get some more Mari in Star Wars, whatever it might it be. Would be. It would be dreamy. It would be dreamy. Absolutely, it would. Yeah. Absolutely, it would. Maybe we can get Mari and Alexis in some Star Wars. That would be good too, would like because your wife is also an actress. Star. I would love to see Alexis in some Star Wars. Absolutely, that, it'd be great for actress. both of y'all, and then we can just yeah. be excited for you. Yeah, yeah. And we can come back. Yeah, no, the badass ladies of Star Wars now, I think, is, is absolutely. Well, I am so thankful for the time that you have given me today uh, to talk Star Wars. It has really been a great start. I want to give you an opportunity. I don't know if you have anything out, anything you want to plug. I know Homeland has recently wrapped up in the last little bit, but do you have anything going on right now? I don't. I'm doing some writing projects at the the sort of pandemic time of, of, of and just a shout out to everybody right now. I know it's a, wherever you stand on anything right now. I know it's a wild time. So I hope you're safe and healthy and you're all right. Um, it, this no, I don't have anything coming up. Everything kind of shut down. Homeland ended. I mean, my latest project is New Dad, which has been a believable role to play. Um, or right as the pandemic shutdown kicked in, um, so it's been good to focus on that, and that's been a, a great job. Um, some writing stuff, and and we'll see. But in terms of TV, future is wide open. That's awesome. Well, uh, well, we're going to we're going to tag you. I don't know if you're very active on Twitter, but we'll put your Twitter handle in the Great. show notes in case anybody wants to follow you on Twitter. Um, I can't say thank you enough for joining me today. It really has been a pleasure. I love talking Star Wars and you're welcome back anytime um, to all of our listeners. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoy this. You can find us on Twitter at Will's Pod. Uh, we are available most places that you can find podcasts. Uh, if you go to Apple, you can like and share and rate and review and all that fun stuff that helps us out a little bit. Um, in the meantime, thank you to our spouses who let us do silly things like make Star Wars podcast. Thank you, thank you to all of you for listening and may the force be with, the you. Force with you always. Thanks, Nick. This is awesome. Thanks, yeah. man.